Hello everyone. Today we are going to feature the first of a three-part series Ohio Mysteries did with the Akron Beacon Journal. We're going to discuss the famous Sweetheart murders from 1979. Now, that's the case of Ricky Baird and Mary Leonard who failed to return home from a date one evening. Now this has been trimmed up a little bit from the podcast so we can present it on YouTube. However, you can still find the full version at ohiomysteries.com. And make sure you tune in next week for part two and the week after that for part three. Hope you enjoy. In the spring of 1979, when love often blossoms along with the daffodils and tulips, Ricky Beard and Mary Leonard became teen sweethearts. Ricky was graduating from North High School. Mary was finishing her junior year. But before Ricky collected his diploma, he asked Mary out. To outsiders, it might have seemed an unlikely pairing. They didn't run in the same circles hang out in the same cliques. But Mary said yes, and the two, in the vernacular of the time, started going steady. Mary was 17, a bright honor roll student with a captivating smile. Here's her older sister, Nancy, and her younger brother, Jerry. She had a smile on her face 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Unless I was making her mad. (laughs) I I really never heard her complain about people and Mm -hmm. life in general. And she uh, she was a go getter. She got her job. She got very passionate about her schoolwork. Yeah, her sports. Mm -hmm. I remember watching her crying at the dining room table because she couldn't get her homework done right. Mm -hmm. That's how passionate she was. Ricky was a good-looking 19-year-old young man. At North High, he had completed a heating and air conditioning program while a student, and he landed a job as a refrigeration technician at the William Lay Company on Main Street in downtown Akron. He was very kind-hearted, and he he loved the little kids in the neighborhood. That's Rick's older sister, Luann Eddy. And the little kids in the neighborhood would come to our house. I mean, four years old, they'd be knocking on our door. Could Rick come out? Rick was a teenager, you know. <laughs> and he babysat. He he loved the winter. He loved the snow. The minute it started snowing, he was out there. He worked at the car wash down at the corner. And um, he just, he always worked. He was always a worker. And I think he kind of tried to be kind of a hard ass, but he wasn't. You know, he really had a soft heart. So, maybe Ricky was a little bit of a bad boy. He smoked some marijuana, wouldn't back down from a fight, wouldn't think twice about borrowing your clothes and daring you to say something about it. A real tough exterior, but enough of a charm that you wanted to dig deeper to find out what was inside. For the time they were together, Mary and Ricky traveled around in his car. As with most teenage boys, Rick's car was his pride and joy. It was a used 1972 Chevy Impala, white with a dark blue roof that he bought from Burt Greenwald Chevrolet and polished regularly. On August 24, 1979, Rick's car was ready for Friday date night. Showers earlier in the day had given way to a clear sky and the promise of a warm and sunny leisurely weekend. Rick finished his work shift, collected his $120 paycheck, and cashed it at North Akron Savings and Loan, where his mom Helen worked. He paid his $105 insurance premium right away, so that didn't leave him with much, but it was enough for a movie with his girl. At the Leonard house, Mary was also getting ready for her date. She'd been running around since that morning, 
At lunchtime, Carla had picked her up and they went together to Carmen Studios in downtown Akron to get the proofs of their senior pictures. They had lunch, walked around Chapel Hill Mall a bit, then hurried home so Mary could start her 4 p.m. shift at Acme. Ricky was supposed to pick Mary up when her shift ended at 9 p.m., but he didn't. Mary got a lift from her manager instead. A few minutes after 9 o'clock, Mary was at home and on the phone to girlfriend Carla, very upset and saying she thought it might be time to break up with Ricky. Mary ended the phone call when she saw Ricky driving down the road to pick her up. If Mary was upset, it wasn't enough to cancel her evening plans. Still wearing her white Acme Zip shirt beneath bib overalls, she and Ricky were off to the old Ascot Drive-In Theater, where the Amityville Horror was playing. It was a popular spot for area teens, especially on a summer Friday night, and lots of classmates were expected to be there. Carla originally planned to join them, but she wasn't feeling well and decided to stay home. Even at the age of 17, Mary might not have been able to go if her dad had really heard what she said as she and Ricky passed by him standing at the kitchen sink. He asked where they were headed, and Mary told him. But Mary's mom figured her husband probably wasn't paying attention, or he would not have let his daughter go to a drive-in with a boy. It was a make-out place. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm-hmm. That wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Kids didn't go there to watch the movie? No. no. There were movies? <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to tell us something? Yeah. What are you trying to tell uh, us? Never among that crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. For, well, for we could go to the drive-in as long as you weren't going with a boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. At well, least you said you weren't going with the boys. Yeah, when you got there, you switched cars. We switched cars. And, but there was a, quite a few of our friends and classmates at the drive-in. So. And so Mary and Ricky went to the drive-in. But they didn't stay very long. Mary had an 11 p.m. curfew. And so before the movie ended, they left, trailed by another couple in a separate car. Between the theater and Mary's home, the two cars pulled into the parking lot of the Stonehenge Bowling Alley. After 10 minutes chatting with their friends in the parking lot, Ricky and Mary drove off, headed to the lettered home so Mary could make curfew. It was the last time anyone saw Mary or Ricky alive. The first person to realize something was wrong was Ricky's dad, William, an early riser who was usually having his first Pepsi by 5 or 6 a.m. Two of his six children were grown and moved out of the family's Collinwood Avenue house by 1979. But the four who remained were all teenagers, three of them with cars. The boy slept in the attic, so the easiest way to account for all of his young charges every morning was to have a look outside and count the cars. There was a car missing this morning, Ricky's Impala. It wasn't immediate cause for concern. He, he had a tendency to fall asleep wherever he was at. It didn't matter. He could, he could sleep on the floor. If nobody was at, he, when he was tired, he was done, he, he, he would be there. That was it. So when he, I, I didn't really raise any, any concern when he didn't come home. We figured he's, you know, he's one of his friend's houses and crashed somewhere. So it wasn't a big deal. That's Bill again. He'd spent the night away himself, and when he got home around 7 that morning, his dad sent him out to have a look around the neighborhood. William often did that himself. He knew all of his children's friends and where they lived. Everybody was right there in North Hill, and sometimes he'd make a quick pass of their houses just to reassure himself that his independent teenagers were accounted for. This time, he shooed Bill out of the house to go have a look and make sure Ricky was safely parked at one of his friends. So I drove around North Hill looking for him, and the car didn't turn up anywhere, so I came home. And The Beard family was only vaguely beginning to realize their son wasn't late. He was actually missing. While Bill was driving around North Hill looking for Ricky's car, William Beard made a call to the Leonard house to see if Mary had gotten home. Jerry Leonard remembers the phone ringing in his home that day, The sun was up. He was a morning guy himself, so he was already awake. 
playing around with a CB radio in his bedroom. Phone rings. Dad answers the phone. He hollers up to me. Is Mary in her room? No. She, I think she went to work early this morning because her bed was made and everything. And um, here was Ricky Beard's dad calling to see if Mary had made it home. And uh, that's when it all started. Jerry was a one-man Amber Alert. He immediately started putting out Mary's description to people he could reach on his CB. Mary's mother had fallen asleep, waiting for her youngest daughter to come home that night. Mom always stayed up. She watched the Johnny Carson show every night, and she always stayed up when, when especially if us girls were out. She would not go to bed until, when, until we walked in that front door, and she had fallen asleep, and um, then didn't wake up till that phone call when Mr. Beer called and wanted to know if Ricky was there. But before either family had the chance to call police, police had called them. At 7.30 that morning, Ronald Collins, an officer with the Northampton Township Police Department, was driving along Portage Trail near the intersection with Northampton Road. In another decade, Northampton would become part of the city of Cuyahoga Falls, but in 1979, the township still existed with its own police department. Officer Colin spotted a car where there shouldn't have been a car, on farmland, shoved up against the entrance of an abandoned cinder block garage with rotting wooden doors, located on a dirt lane that was no longer used. It looked as if someone had hoped to pull the car into the garage, then realized it wouldn't fit. He ran the license plate number, found Ricky's name, and called his home. And then it was, you know, panic. Ricky's wallet was tucked behind the visor of the car. A $5 bill was on the floor. A bag of Doritos and a blanket were in the back seat. There was something else in the car, something that shouldn't have been there. A bullet hole. The trajectory put a shooter in the back seat, gun hand low, aiming up. The bullet went through the passenger seat and exited the windshield. It didn't appear the bullet hit anything. There was no blood. That, that, that was the bullet I was put in that car that Friday evening. And so it was time to start looking for Rick and Mary beyond North Hill. Searchers headed three miles away to that farm, where Cuyahoga Falls begins its descent into scenic, rural, and heavily forested Merriman Valley. And in talk, talking to police, we decided to go to that farm lane where the car was found and do a search. So we got people, I don't know, neighborhood people, volunteers came, came up there and we just kind of spread out and started walking through the farm fields up there where the car was, see if we could find anything. The search of the farmland yielded nothing useful. There were several spent shells littering the ground, but the area was favored by hunters. Some of that was to be expected. The car was dusted for fingerprints. The seat with a bullet hole was removed and sent to the crime lab. The Beards were given their car back. The family drove it home, then hid it in a neighbor's garage to stop gawkers from coming by to look at it. I think by the time Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning rolled around, I think then it got real. Like, okay, they really are gone. They're really not coming back. Mary Leonard's senior photo, the one she'd picked up the day she disappeared, became her missing poster. Looking for any consolation she could find, Mary's mom, Gloria, was so thankful she at least had that last picture of her daughter. That same day, um, after she had picked up her pictures, she was going to take them with them. I don't right. know if, if to work or when she was with Ricky. And mom asked her to keep them at the house in case any of us came, happened to stop by so we could see the pictures. And she is so glad she... She stressed that because she says we probably would never have these pictures, these recent pictures mm -mm. of her. Police spent the next few days trying to put together a timeline of that Friday night and Saturday morning. Paul Herbrook, who owned the farm where Ricky's car was found, was the closest person living to the site. 
He told police he heard a car door slam around 2 a.m. that morning. But there was a bar at the corner of Portage Trail and Northampton Road, so he didn't think much of strange noises in the middle of the night. But it was the statement of a Leonard's neighbor that created the most stir, causing never-ending controversy because it foils so many theories. Frank Ronka told police Mary was home by 11 p.m. and Ricky was with her. He didn't see them because they were sitting on the front steps of the Leonard home, just below the porch and out of his view. But he heard them talking. He heard Mary giggling. And he recognized Ricky's car parked on the street. He would watch the news and then he would go out and have a smoke. Well, that night, there was a baseball game out, I think, that ran over. So the news ran over. So he knows he was out there like a half an hour or so later than he normally would have been. And he says, he, and he rec- he, even though he didn't see them, my sister was laughing about something. He said, he, you, you knew her laugh. And he says, he remember seeing his car out front, and they were apparently on the front steps in front of the porch where they couldn't be seen from uh, his porch. He wouldn't be able to see them. But he, he swears that they were there at least for a short time that night. We, we spent a lot of days. I mean, because the way the, the, the front yard was, you could sit down there, and Mary was always afraid if we sat on the porch that would interrupt her parents. So we always sat down closer to the street, so if we were laughing or talking loud or whatever, then mom and dad couldn't hear us. So, I don't know. Maybe they were there, maybe they weren't, I don't know. It's hard for police and hard for family to piece together a scenario that would have Mary leaving again when she and Ricky had just made the effort to get her home by curfew. Mary knows the rules yeah okay I mean we we you know we weren't the children that bucked the system Mary was home Mary would have never left again because Mary knew if you're home you need to stay home you're not to go back out again because she would get in trouble and it was getting late but Mary's brother Tom can conceive of someone following Ricky and Mary home possibly to coerce Rick into going with them for what reason nobody can say And maybe Mary was taken, either because she was a witness or to use against Rick in some fashion. I think there's a possibility that whatever happened, that started right there. And not only because of what the neighbor said. Turns out one of the Leonard brothers had heard a strange noise that night. Something he didn't think twice about until learning about the bullet hole found in Ricky's car. Ron who was in bed at the time, he said he was sleeping almost with his head on the, on the windowsill because it was so hot, just trying to get a breeze through the window. And he said it didn't dawn on him until the next morning that what he'd heard, uh, what he thought was a fire, might have been a firecracker, could have been a gunshot. Whatever happened, both the Beard and Leonard families argued with police that their children were absolutely not runaways. There was nothing in their manner, in their relationship, and the events of the day that would support two teens running away with no money, no clothes, and leaving behind their only transportation, a car, by the way, that had a bullet hole in it. Neither one of them took money. Neither one of them had money. They maybe had money in a bank account, but nobody touched it. So where did they go? Soon after Mary and Ricky disappeared, the Leonard family decided to seek extra help. The family read about a private investigator named William Deere, who had worked on some nationally known missing persons cases. The Leonards gave him a call. Deere left his home in Dallas, where he lived on a 28-acre estate, drove an Aston Martin, and had a private airfield. He flew to Akron in his personal jet, wearing a three-piece suit. His normal fee was $1,000 a day in 1979 currency. He gave the Leonards an undisclosed discount. Still, he didn't come cheap. To pay his fee, the Leonard family and their friends held fundraisers. 
We had a dance. Craft show. Two, actually, there was two different dances um, that were held to raise money. I, we had a strangers even coming to the door handing yeah. money. Uh, one kid in particular, the paper boy, had saved money to um, buy a, a bicycle, a new bicycle, and he left a, a jar of the money on the front porch with the note. You know, mom went out to get the paper. She saw the, the note there. That one there, that kid there just, he's the one that's always stuck in my mind that he, mm -hmm. he did that. that. The Deer Agency set up shop at the Cuyahoga Falls Town & Country Motor Hotel. They told reporters their track record for finding missing persons was 100%. Within a couple of weeks of getting started, they said they found a witness who saw a man in the back seat of Rick's car as Ricky pulled onto the abandoned farm lane where his Chevy was found. They circulated a drawing of a bushy-haired man with a mustache. And in February of 1980, they made an announcement. Their investigators had a credible source that knew Ricky and Mary were alive and well and living out of state. He promised to share more details the following week. But the details never came. The bushy-haired man was never identified, found, or confirmed. And the Deer investigators went back to Texas. In May of 1980, nine months after the couple vanished, police received a tip that led them to organize a search of the banks of the Little Cuyahoga River, specifically where the river passes under Memorial Parkway in Akron, then north to where the Little Cuyahoga joins the Cuyahoga River. The police weren't specific about the tip, only saying that their source didn't have firsthand knowledge but overheard something about Ricky and Mary having been killed, their bodies lying close to the river. On a Saturday morning, when the rain would not stop, more than 150 people showed up to tackle the unfriendly and now muddy landscape, where the river was bordered by tangled briars, poison ivy, tall weeds, decaying falling limbs, and sheer banks that turned up unexpectedly along the winding waterway. National Guardsmen, Marine Reservists, and Akron police officers led the civilians. They held their breath collectively each time a volunteer found a bone, which a team was on hand to quickly identify as animal. And there was a tense moment when someone found a woman's shoe that proved not to be Mary's. Even William Deere flew up with four of his private investigators to help. No charge. He said he felt sorry for the families and wanted to make this one last effort. By now, he had changed his mind, telling media he was confident the teens were not runaways, that they were likely dead. Several of Rick and Mary's family members were among the searchers, including Tim Beard. Yeah, they brought the uh, army trucks to haul the people around. There's a lot of people. Red Cross was down there feeding people. And we always had hope. You know, we wouldn't have been doing this. We didn't have the hope. You know, eventually we were going to find them. Eight hours times 150 people. And it was still like searching for a needle in a haystack. The area they covered didn't even reach to the adjacent Caga Valley National Park where a killer would have 32,000 acres of woods at his disposal. Nobody had a clue. Not really. Not for six years. The tips and the leads slowed down. The phones stopped ringing. And then, one pleasant, sunny day in May of 1985, the phones of the Leonard and Beard families started ringing once more. On part two of Elusive Justice, the story of Ricky Beard and Mary Leonard. As soon as I walked in the door, the phone rings and it was my mother-in-law calling, saying, your mom's been trying to get a hold of you. They think they found Mary and Ricky. 